Hey there, welcome back to our Sky Tonight program. My name is Seth Mayo. I'm the curator of astronomy for the Loman Planetarium. And in this episode, we're covering the dates of October 4th through October 10th, 2021. We're going to start things off by talking about the constellation of Pegasus, the winged horse, that is now nicely placed in the east just after sunset. We'll then talk about the lesser known meteor shower called the Draconids that peaks this week. And we'll end things with a highlight of where the moon will pass by the planet Venus. So, Let's get to it. Now that we're into the fall, this is a great time of the year, if you're looking towards the east, to find the wonderful constellation of Pegasus, the winged horse, arguably one of the more famous characters from Greek mythology. And it's nicely placed if you're looking directly east after sunset. You don't have to wait too long to see it. It's already fairly high in the sky once it gets dark out. And the best way to locate it is find four stars that make a large square or rectangle. It's called the square of Pegasus, and it is an asterism. And here is that square right here in Stellarium. You can kind of see it. These aren't the brightest stars you can find in the sky, but they do stand out. And you will notice that if you're looking in this area on a clear night, just to kind of highlight this square here. Here are asterisms turned on. There's a whole bunch more that you can see in Stellarium, but there it is, the square of Pegasus. Pegasus. And if you do find that square, there are other stars that make up the constellation. The square is the body of this mythological flying horse. Then we have the head that kind of makes its way out here, goes a little bit higher in the sky, kind of curves in that way. And some of the legs are here. So there are still a lot of parts of Pegasus that are up to your imagination, but just adding the lines here, you can see the main stars that contribute to the constellation, and then it'll put up the artwork as well. And of course, a mythological creature, a flying horse, is fun to think about. And you do find this horse on logos and as mascots for schools and in stories and movies as well. So it's a very popular creature that is brought up from time to time in pop culture. This constellation, like many, has a lot of mythology versions. There are many different ways to tell a story of Pegasus. Where this flying horse possibly came from, at least as told by ancient storytellers, is that the Gorgon named Medusa, that kind of scary lady that has snake hair and you look in her eyes and you turn to stone. In some stories, Pegasus is the offspring of Medusa. In one more gory story, when Perseus, the mighty warrior who fights Medusa and ultimately kills her, he cuts off her head and the blood from her head falls into an ocean and for some reason, Pegasus springs out of the ocean from that. So that's one version you hear at times, especially when talking about Perseus. In other versions of Greek mythology, Pegasus is born from Poseidon or created by Poseidon who had this creature kind of lift out or shoot out from the water and become this majestic flying horse. And in some stories as well, the very famous warrior and slayer of scary creatures known as Bellerophon happened to befriend and take ride of Pegasus to fight the creature known as Chimera. If you know Chimera, that's this weird lion and goat and serpent kind of creature, very strange creature from Greek mythology. And Pegasus is involved with the slaying of Chimera. And in those stories, Bellerophon wanted to be with the gods so much, he tried to fly Pegasus up to Mount Olympus to join the gods, and ultimately he failed and died, along with Pegasus falling back down to Earth. And Zeus, the leader of all the gods, was sad to see Pegasus die like that, so he placed the flying horse into the stars as the constellation we see today. So as you can see, there are many different versions of stories regarding Pegasus, but he's beloved nonetheless, and fun to find in the sky. If you do happen to find Pegasus rising out of the east, there are some interesting stars to take note of, especially some of the brighter ones. And what's great is they all have a meaning that relate to where they are inside of Pegasus. If we go to the star that's at the end of the head, this star right here, it's called Enif, which in Arabic means the nose. So that's the nose of the horse. It's in the right place, so that makes sense. As we continue down to the square, some of the brightest stars in Pegasus here, we'll go right down here to this kind of top right corner as seen in this view. And that's a star called Markab. And Markab is Arabic for the saddle. It kind of sits where the saddle would be if you were riding Pegasus. We go to the top left here, and we have a star called Shait. And Shait possibly means the left shoulder 
of the horse. So it kind of would fit in that part of this creature. As we go down to this star here, to the bottom right, we have Al Janib. Al Janib is another Arabic named star. That means the side. And the last star of the square is this one right here. And when I click on it, you're gonna notice some other stars start to appear or another constellation kind of turn on. That star is called Al Faraz, which means the navel of the horse or the navel of the mare. Navel, of course, being the belly button. And it kind of sits, I guess, where the belly button of the horse would be. So that star historically has been connected to two constellations, partly with Pegasus, but partly with this other one here of Andromeda, the princess. And actually, technically speaking, this star really belongs with that constellation. That's what's official today. But the star does kind of bridge the gap between these two constellations. So Andromeda, the princess, you find right here directly connected to Pegasus. She is not far away. And that star Alpha Rats, you know that is part of Andromeda because if we turn on the constellation boundaries, so the boundaries are these areas of the sky that show you exactly where a constellation lies. These were decided upon by the International Astronomical Union or the IAU in 1930. And so eventually this star Alpha Rats was actually placed within the boundary of Andromeda that you see here. So a constellation is not just the stars that make up a picture, it's actually the boundary area that was figured out in the 1930s. And so you can see, if you look closely here, within the boundary, Alpha Rats sits right inside of the Andromeda territory. So even though historically it's kind of been part of Pegasus and Andromeda, technically speaking, that star is part of Andromeda, the princess, as you see there. And one last star I want to mention that's really important to find inside Pegasus is one that's not very bright. You'd have to be in a very dark place to actually see it with your naked eyes. So most likely a telescope will allow you to see it. And that's the star right at the chest of Pegasus, right here. So again, it's very, very dim. That star, you'll notice the top left says Helvetios. But actually in astronomy, it's called 51 Pegasi. And this is a very important star because in 1995, this star was confirmed to have a planet around it. It's the first main sequence star that was discovered to have an exoplanet, a planet beyond our solar system. This exoplanet, now known as 51 Pegasi b, is a hot Jupiter, a very large Jupiter-sized planet. It's a little smaller than Jupiter, but it's pretty big and orbits really closely to that star 51 Pegasi and only takes four days to go around the star. So it is a very intense planetary system, but important for exoplanet research as being one of the first ever discovered, at least around a main sequence star found inside of Pegasus. So that is a very significant area for exoplanet research right inside the chest of Pegasus, the winged horse that we find rising out of the east now, a really great fall constellation. Within this week from October 6th through October 10th is the annual peak of a lesser known and not as active meteor shower called the Draconids. And this is a quiet meteor shower that has only about 10 meteors per hour on average. And this meteor shower is named after the constellation it radiates from. That is the very large but rather dim constellation in the northern part of our sky known as Draco the dragon. This is a long kind of winding dragon in the sky that's situated between the Big Dipper, which you can find right here low in the northwest in the evening sky, and the Little Dipper. And it actually even goes beyond that a little higher up in the sky. So the radiant point for the Draconids actually is near the head of this dragon that we find right about here. So if we turn on the picture of the dragon here in Stellarium, you can kind of see the head of it. Really interesting constellation. And the two stars that are nearest the radiant point, and again, the radiant point is the place, not exactly where you'll just see the meteors, but at least where they radiate from. You'll find these two stars here, some of the more famous stars within Draco. This star here is Rastaban, which I love that name. And we have this star here called El Tanin. So those two stars right at the head of Draco the Dragon marks kind of near the point of the radiant for the Draconid meteor shower. Another way to find that radiant point is actually near the summer triangle that you still find in the fall. There's this really big triangle asterism in the sky. These three stars are fairly bright and they're really high up in the evening. The radiant point is actually nearest 
to the brightest part of the triangle, this star right here, which is Vega. So not too far from Vega, a little bit north of Vega, you'll find the head of Draco and that radiant point there. So this meteor shower goes on from the 6th through the 10th, but the actual peak of it this year is the evening of October 8th. And that's kind of interesting about this particular meteor shower. Most meteor showers usually peak in the morning. But for this one, because of its location in the sky, it actually peaks in the evening right after sunset. And it helps that the moon is not too large as well. If you look to the left here, over to more of the west or southwestern part of the sky, there's a very thin crescent moon. So you won't have a large bright moon on the evening of October 8th to ruin your chances of seeing some of the meters. Again, not one of the most active, but throughout history, it did have some really big outbursts. In 1933 and 1946, there were tons of meters that came from this particular meteor shower. And it comes from a comet known as 21P Giacobini Zinner. The P indicates that it's a short period comet. It only takes about six and a half years to go around the sun. Giacobini and Zinner are the names of the two discoverers. Michel Giacobini is a French astronomer who discovered in 1900, and separately, Ernst Zinner, in 1913, confirmed the meteor shower as well. And even though it's not one of the most active meteor showers, it was interesting for our understanding that meteors are derived from the debris trail of comets. So every time a comet goes around the sun, it leaves behind debris, and we go through that debris trail for different meteor showers throughout the year. And of course, the fall and winter is the active season for meteors. It's when we go through some of the best comet and even asteroid trails, giving us some chances for meteor showers. So the Draconids are something to maybe look out for in the evening sky on the 8th. Again, you might not see too many, but if you do, you may be looking at a meteor or two that is lesser known and stems from a really interesting constellation in the northern part of our sky. Now, as you round out the week and weekend, we're gonna find the moon will be well-placed in the evening towards the west and southwest just after sunset. And of course, our sunset is getting earlier and earlier as we head closer and closer to winter time. One thing to remember is our days are now getting shorter and our nights are longer. So if we start on the 8th here, Friday evening, you'll see a very thin crescent moon just above the west. But what's really great about the moon is it's getting closer to the brightest planet in our sky as we head into the weekend. So we go to the 9th and right at the 9th here, Saturday evening, you'll see the moon will be right above Venus. Now we have the moon a little bit exaggerated here, so we're going to actually scale the moon down to the right size here, so you can kind of see at least the true angular separation between these two objects here. So there we have it. So there is a thin crescent moon, there is Venus. So they're still very close to one another. And here in Stellarium, which is really great, we have this little distance measuring tool here too. So we can measure between one object and another, so we'll go from the moon to Venus, and roughly speaking, it's about two and a half degrees. So a half a degree is the width of a full moon. So this roughly speaking would be about five full moon widths apart. So that's relatively close and kind of a nice pair to look out for in the evening. So you'll have that on Saturday night and these objects will be within the head of the constellation of Scorpius the Scorpion, this leftover summertime constellation that we can find here getting really low in the southwest. We can actually start to say farewell to Scorpius at this time of year here in the fall. But we still have a little time to see it, but during this weekend we'll find some objects situated inside of this fleeting constellation. So that's on the 9th, and then as we head over to the 10th here on Sunday night, you'll see the moon will move a little farther away, kind of above Scorpius here, in the sky. And one other star to kind of take note of in this area is the heart of the scorpion on Taurus right here, this great red giant star. So there's a nice grouping of objects here in the evening with the moon being a nice crescent shape passing by the brightest planet in the sky, Venus, which is really, really bright and still high up, and also finding Scorpius and its heart star of Antares as it starts to set is also nice as well. 
Well, that's it for another edition of our Sky Tonight program. Thank you very much for tuning in. And if you're in the area, please stop by the Museum of Arts and Sciences and definitely the Loman Planetarium. We're running shows every day. And our new fall schedule just came out as well. So check online for more information about all of that. So we hope to see you back here again. Take care. And of course, happy stargazing. <laughs>